So in the cucurbit family, um, the cucurbits is a shorthand uh, that refers broadly to plants in the cucurbitaceae family. Uh, another uh, shorthand you'll see, especially in uh, some uh, applied literature, refers to them as vine crops. So collectively, the cucurbitaceae cucurbits include a number of crops that uh, many of us are familiar with. Uh, so cucumber, melon, watermelon, and a number of different squash uh, and uh, that are all part of, and pumpkins that are all part of the cucurbita genus. So one of the great resources we have to, as we work with these crops, is some of the collections in the USDA National Plant Germplasm System. Uh, so for instance, cucumber, uh, cucinus sativus, there's uh, over a thousand accessions. Uh, and cucumber, it's, it's used for everything from a fresh market, slicing to pickling, uh, kind of in the U.S. Uh, melon, cucumis milo, over 2,000 accessions uh, readily available. Um, and this would include cantaloupe, honeydew, musk melon, some great sources of beta carotene and some great flavors to be found there. Watermelon, uh, Citrullus lanatus, again, many accessions. Watermelon is uh, known as a great source of lycopene uh, in the diet. There's a great bioavailability. And then all the jack-o'-lanterns, pipe pumpkins, zucchinis, winter squash, butternut, cake, corn, uh, all of those are in the cucurbita genus, uh, where there's a uh, split between three different species. Uh, Peepo, where you often find a lot of the jack-o'-lanterns, zucchinis, acorn squash, moshada, which is typically uh, what we find is our butternut squash and cucurbita maxima, which has lots of crops like uh, Hubbard and buttercup squash. So all of these different genetic seed stocks are great resources we want to do improvement uh, in, the in the cucurbitaceae. And also a complementary resource is a gene list uh, maintained by the cucurbit genetics cooperative. Uh, with the, the link is there at the bottom of the slide. And what that does is it has a lot of these different crops and some of the major genes that have been found to be important for uh, improvement of these in terms of growth habit, yield, disease resistance, color, and uh, along with, uh, you can see more there, that's just a very nice roadmap for us as we do some of our uh, reading to be able to guide uh, some of our approaches. Okay. And one of the reasons we grouped all the cucurbits together in this talk is there's some great commonalities you find between them. Uh, there are first uh, a set of really conserved needs in the cucurbits. So in terms of the pests and pathogens that affect them, uh, there are uh, several that uh, to different extents affect uh, different uh, genera in the cucurbitaceae, but are all still uh, important nonetheless. Uh, powdery mildew, uh, an image on near the top of the slide. Downy mildew, uh, relatively uh, newer pathogen to hear about. Um, that is definitely on the, the upswing in the U.S., nor Northeast, and globally. Phytophthora, Phytophthora blight. No, Phytophthora capsicity is a soil-borne pathogen that's different than Phytophthora and pestans, a late blight pathogen. Uh, gummy stem blight, black rot. Um, these are two diseases. Uh, black rot is used to describe when you see this appear uh, in a storage uh, stage of the path of uh, a winter squash. Gummy stem blight refers to uh, the same pathogen, just having a different symptom in the growing uh, tissue of the plant. Uh, some viruses, particularly in the U.S., cucumber mosaic virus and pody viruses that can have some very pronounced leaf cysts symptoms, fruit disfigurement, and other losses, and cucumber beetles are just a ubiquitous pest, uh, pest that we have to deal with in all cucurbits. In addition to having all kind of some of the same breeding goals, another um, uh, commonality is they all have a similar breeding approach. Uh, so for the most part, uh, all the cucurbits we work with are self-compatible, uh, diploids, and they have little inbreeding depression. Um, and with that, it really lends itself to a pedigree approach. Um, but one of the factors behind the little inbreeding depression uh, is that the cucurbits in general went through a 
uh, genetic bottleneck in their history, and that just really depressed the amount of uh, variability there was to start with. Uh, so things we can do to increase diversity is also important. I'll talk about that later. Uh, but right now, um, recurrent selection is also something that uh, works well with this crop um, because it's monoecious. Um, and so you get a lot of pollination happening by bees that are moving uh, pollen between male and female flowers on one plant and different plants. Um, we also, though, find a lot of other uh, forms of sex expression in, in the cucurbits. For instance, uh, gynecious plants are common in high-yielding cucumbers, so every flower uh, on the cucumber plant uh, makes a cucumber fruit. Uh, and andromenaceous is a trait found in melon and watermelon. And so the, the nuts and bolts of uh, kind of some of the breeding and how we go about uh, these selections after the introduction. Um, so pollination, the techniques are uh, especially easy in squash. Uh, we have an image of uh, a squash pollination where you know, it's a very big uh, flower to pollinate. Uh, all the cucurbits work essentially the same, although they might be quite a bit smaller. But so the day before, uh, we close the buds that we're going to want to cross the next morning. Uh, the key is selecting uh, buds that have full color in the petals. Uh, and if we're doing this inside in the greenhouse or we have good insect control, we don't have to worry about flying buds, uh, we can skip this step and that saves uh, quite a bit of work. Um, then uh, the other uh, step that we have to do with some flowers, actually before we close them, is there are some flowers that need to be emasculated. And so if they are perfect or complete flowers, for instance, on those andromenaceous plants, we have to remove the anthers also the day before so we don't end up with a self-pollination where we want it across. So the morning of uh, the pollination, uh, first is a matter of unclipping the flowers, transferring the pollen. Uh, in the case of cucumber, that doesn't produce much pollen per flower. We'll use uh, more than one male flower to do the pollination. And then it's just a matter of uh, covering the female flower with a tightly affixed bag or a gel cap for some of the smaller uh, flowers, uh, like in melons and watermelons, uh, just to make sure that no other bees get there with any other pollen. So the duration of the time we have to do these pollinations, so when pollen shed will start, will depend on the season, valence, and uh, the weather, and especially in the summer as the temperatures get really warm. As the day gets really hot, we'll find that the pollen is just viable for a shorter period in the day. So we try to get all our pollinations done before lunch in the summer. And in some of the crops uh, where we want need to uh, modify the forms of flowers that are available to us, um, so either if we need more female flowers or more male flowers, there's some chemical control that we can uh, add to be able to influence that. So for instance, if we need to increase the number of female flowers or get a male plant to produce female flowers, there's a chemical ethophon that can induce the number of female flowers. And there's also uh, silver compounds like silver thiosulfate that we can spray on a uh, female plant, the growing tip, to uh, make it start to produce some male flowers. Also, uh, for organic growers that want to do a seed increase of a all-female gynecious line, uh, there are some gibberellins that can be used. Uh, and so, especially with these uh, all-female lines, uh, having all the flowers in the plant yielding fruit is important uh, for yield for the grower. Uh, and it's also important for hybrid seed production, or if you have an all-female plant next to a monoecious plant, uh, you can very efficiently produce seed of uh, uh, cucumbers that way that are a hybrid where all the seed you collect off the all-female line is pollinated by the monoecious one next to it. There's also some convenient uh, things that change during the season. Uh, for instance, watermelons are especially difficult to pollinate in the summer because the flower buds are green uh, and hidden uh, right before uh, the day before they open for pollination. 
So as you move into the greenhouse, especially in the winter, we find many andromenaceous flowers that become monaceous, and so that just really expedites the process. And so if we look at the whole uh, process uh, throughout the season, so right now, uh, starting yesterday, in fact, we started to sow seed and 50 cell traits to go to the field. In early June, we will transplant our hardened off seedlings. The pollinations will start in early July and continue to mid-August with some of the uh, shorter season squash like cucurbit of people flowering earlier. And then after we do a pollination, in addition to writing the male and female parents on the tag, we also include the date. And that's important uh, to make sure that we leave fruit on until the seeds are ripe and mature, which is about uh, six weeks, uh, about eight weeks for winter squash. Then we have a, a month or two to get some data analysis done before we need to make our selection to decide on the winter generation of a plant in the greenhouse. And so we try to stage this so the winter generation is smaller. Many of these are large plants that need to be trellised in the greenhouse. Um, and so we try to have our big populations in the field. And, and also in the greenhouse generation, we set up the, the population so we can avoid selecting for traits with a lot of G by E because we don't want to be necessarily selecting for adaptation to the greenhouse in the winter uh, if we're looking for a field grown plant. And one of the challenges in cucurbit breeding, uh, I could refer to as the uncertainty principle with squash, uh, applies to all cucurbits. And so the challenge is to be able to get many of your pollinations. Uh, there will be lots of open pollinated fruit that, that uh, uh, female flowers that open and are pollinated uh, over the weekend or at times when we don't make it there to do the pollination or when we just don't have the right male flower uh, to use to do the pollination then. Um, so the issue is by leaving these open pollinated fruit on, we bias our ability to get a good idea of the yield quality or disease resistance scores for the plant. So for winter squash, uh, where uh, they're consumed as mature fruit, if we're continually stripping fruit off the plant, the fewer fruit that will be on uh, at the end of the season uh, will be uh, biased because they will have been growing on the plant with a lower fruit load. And if we're looking at uh, something like a cucumber or a zucchini, uh, where they're consumed at the immature stage, leaving the, the pollination on the plant will actually cause fruit set to diminish. And so in either case, leaving uh, those fruit on the plant or taking them off are going to bias uh, the phenotype we observe of the plant and how we evaluate it, if it will advance or not in the breeding program. So one of the ways we have right now to get around this uh, is by taking cuttings. And so it can be rather disheartening at the end of the season after we've made thousands of pollinations in the field by closing flowers, marking with flags, coming back the next morning uh, and finding all these plants and doing the crosses and then letting the fruit get mature and plants that take up a lot of real estate in the field is that we leave most of all that hard work behind and so often you know, at least 90% of those plants will stay behind uh, in the field and so anything we can do to reduce that workload can really help us make progress. So um, right now uh, we are having more efforts with recurrent selection but with open pollination that really only works for the maternal genetics because the, the pollen could have come from a plant that had undesirable characteristics. Luckily, most of the cucurbits, especially the vining types, root readily from cuttings. You'll see them putting uh, uh, roots out of the nodes as they trail along the ground, and so this is something that works really well. And by having cuttings instead of uh, working with doing a self or cross pollination on all the plants in the field, we can work with much larger populations. So moving from uh, hundreds of plants to thousands of plants. And having those much larger populations, uh, uh, while it results in fewer generations per year, we can get more gain per generation with less effort. And so we'll put eight, uh, a couple thousand, up to 10,000 plants in the field, uh, walk the field at the end of the season to make our selections, uh, Root a cutting, bring it back to the greenhouse, 
root it, and then we have our whole, um, instead of pollinating uh, hundreds of plants or no, thousands of plants, we're just uh, focusing on the uh, few percent of the population we actually wanted to advance. The major uh, downside with this, in addition to reducing the number of generations per year, is that it also uh, makes your population, your selections, vulnerable to disease. So in cucurbits, there are uh, the seedborne pathogens are fortunately uh, mostly able to be uh, controlled by having a disinfectant wash of the seed. Uh, but uh, when we're moving cuttings in, that vegetative tissue uh, can often have some different uh, viral issues uh, that uh, while the plant can grow out of them uh, in really favorable growing conditions, uh, that is something that gets maintained and moved to the greenhouse that we would prefer to avoid. And as we are starting to look at some new techniques, especially genomic selection and see how we can apply it to service. Our interests are different than uh, many other people that um, are working especially in the grains where it's this process that we're trying to come up with alternatives to. So being able to only move, only transplant plants to the field that had uh, a good breeding value uh, instead of going through the process of doing many pollinations uh, that end up not being kept or just taking cuttings, which has the other effect of slowing down the number of generations per year. Um, so with that, looking at kind of the, the mechanics of how we do uh, the breeding, I'm going to talk about some of the opportunities, some uh, progress we've been able to make, uh, and directions we are looking forward to going in the future.